Well, this evening, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church midweek service. And we're all comfortable, warm, and together. So, amen to that. And tonight, I'm going to do a so short presentation on John. Not the Gospel of John, but the person of John. You know, so often we read the books of the Bible and we look for the doctrine, the teachings, the preachings, the circumstances, but so often we don't look at some of the hints of the personalities of whom we're reading. So tonight I want to look at John. If you remember, we did Matthew, the Jewish tax collector. We did Mark, the young man that... Uh, was really the disciple of Peter, and also wrote the book of Mark, like Matthew, the book of Matthew, and also Luke, Luke, the doctor, Gentile physician that accompanied Paul on many of his missionary journeys. And tonight, I thought we'd look at John, the Apostle John. The first thing I wanted to do was show you the intimacy right from the start of John with Jesus and the other disciples that lived on the Lake of Galilee. So if you first look at the little map that I gave you, almost in the center, it's a little faded to print, but it's the Sea of Galilee in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out that Saida, the upper right-hand corner of the lake, if you see that, and Capernaum. And those are the two key town villages that we'll, I wanted to address tonight because the Lord uses Capernaum as his base in the Galilean area and John and his brother lived in Bethsaida, the village next door. And found an interesting thing on YouTube where they had recently discovered the, the stone road between the two villages. So apparently you can go there today. The two villages are, are um, both ruins, and I'll get back to that in a moment, but the two ruins are there that you can go to on the Sea of Galilee, and the road that connection, connects them, which clearly Jesus would have walked, if we want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, clearly that's one of the paths and the views of the lake and the mountains that you could see today. So if you look how they're very close, these two villages, Bethsaida and Capernaum. And just as a side note, the two villages don't exist today because Jesus said they will not exist. And if you remember when he was leaving the area of Galilee. He had a, Jesus had a few woes. And a few of the woes were to some of the villages, which re partially rejected him. And Capernaum was one, and Bethsaida was another. There was a third. But those two villages that Jesus, on his exit, spoke about the woes on them for not for rejecting him would not exist. And 2,000 years later, they don't exist. But you can see how close they are. And that's what I wanted to point out. Since Jesus made, <coughs> let's call it the center of his operation and his missions were in Capernaum. And the, uh, the two brothers were John and Peter as well. Peter, Andrew, uh, John, and his brother, um, Blank. James. James. James, thank you. James. And don't confuse him later with the brother of Jesus, James, which we'll talk about as well. But the four of them are neighbors. Four of them are fishermen. So you see they have all something in common. And if you recall, they were all followers of John the Baptist. So today we'll be speaking of John the Apostle. And a little background first I'd like to start with. And again, we're not looking at the, the book of John, 
We're trying to glean from the Word of God a little bit about John the person. So first, he was born and raised in Bethsaida, as I said, near the Capernaum, where Peter and Andrew were also. Two small fishing villages by the Sea of Galilee. His father was a Zebedee. He was a well-off businessman, and we know that because the scriptures talk about that he had uh, boats, plural, he had servants, he had employees, so he had a, apparently a thriving fishing, di fishing business on the Lake of Galilee. And also, many people interpret the fact that, and I'll speak to it more directly later, if you remember, two, two disciples followed Jesus after the arrest in Gethsemane. Peter and John. But the difference was John could go into the area where Jesus was being tried, where Peter stayed without. And one of the reasons is the Sanhedrin that was meeting there knew John. And many of the Bible scholars probably well, most of them uh, opine that John was able to go right in to the palace there where Jesus was being tried because of the, his father was well known to them. Again, a businessman on the Lake of Galilee. But a small village nonetheless, and again, his father was well a businessman. It's not clear, because it's not said so in the scripture, of whether Zebedee was a follower of Jesus. We know his sons were of John the Baptist and of Jesus. And we also know that his mother, Shalomi, was a follower, believer of Jesus. So I'm going to read first. We turn to Matthew 27, and I'll be reading 55 and 56. Matthew 27, verse 55 and 56. And this is the testimony of Salome in the Bible. Two critical places she shows up where many others did not. Matthew 27, 55, and 56. And many women were there beholding afar off. This is at the crucifixion. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto them. So we have a group of women that followed Jesus from Galilee, from Capernaum to Jerusalem, doing his trip to the, at the Passover and his arrest, and now at the cross of Jesus, verse 56, among which was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, that's Jesus' mother. James and Joseph are Jesus' brothers. And the mother of Zebedee's children, that's John and James. So his mother, or Zebedee's wife, was present at the cross. The other place to look at is Mark 16, 1 and 2. Mark 16, 1 and 2. And again, we're looking at the testimony of John and Andrew's mother, Salome. So Mark 16, verse 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, and this is again after the crucifi crucifixion, after the burial of Jesus in the tomb, the women are coming with the ointments to use on Jesus' body, as the custom was then. So again, 16, 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, again, they couldn't work on the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, there she is again, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, anoint Jesus in the tomb. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. 
So here she was with the other ladies. First thing in the morning, we need to anoint the body of our Savior. And there's Salome, again, John and Andrew's mother. So again, father was Zebedee, and mother was Shalom, Shalom. Uh, John was born about, and it's an estimate, about 6 AD, and he died a natural death about 100 AD. So you could see he was approximately 90 years old. So he was there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry right on through uh, the time when he was exiled to Patmos, through the time after Patmos, he was um, released and went back. And the early church fathers, and these are again the first generation after the apostles, in their writings they say he returned to Ephesus and he passed away in Ephesus. The, as far as we know, again through the early church fathers, he's the only apostle that died a natural death. So around 90 years old. So he was in his 20s when he was walking with the Lord on earth. So a young man, probably the youngest apostle. The young, youngest disciple of Jesus. And John's calling. First he followed John the Baptist, as his brother did. And later, on his father's boat, he was fishing, uh, which was his career, and Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee, to the beach, calls John, follow me. Like Matthew, so if you remember Matthew sitting at the tax table, Jesus says, follow me. Matthew immediately gets up and follows him. Here, Jane, here John is fishing on his father's boat, and Jesus comes along on the shore and says, follow me. He immediately gets off the boat and follows Jesus. No excuses. And if you remember some of the scripture where they talk about, um, follow me, no, I really have some work to do at home. Follow me, no, I have to attend my cattle. And these kind of excuses that the, that the scripture talks about. And John was one of those where Jesus said, follow me, and immediately he followed him. A lesson for us. John and James, who has a Mark 3.17? Please read it loudly so we all can hear. Mark 3.17. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges. Bonerges? That's it. Sorry. That is son of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite. So what name does Jesus give to John and James? that reflects their character. Sons of Thunder. So do you think with that name given to them, they were humble <laughs> and quiet types that always let the other person go first through the door? <laughs> Sons of Thunder. Can you imagine? And again, when we look at the scripture to look for a little bit of the personalities. So there's one example where in the scripture, John goes to Jesus and said, you know, I found an unauthorized person who was casting out demons, and I told him to stop. And if you don't remember that story, Jesus' response was, Jesus rebuked him. Likewise, who has John 9, 51, 56? John, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 9, oh, I, 51, 51 56. I have that. 56. Loud, please. Oh, yeah, okay. Luke 9, 51, 
56. And again, we're looking at the personality of these sons of thunder. Okay. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Amen. So you could see the root cause of what Jesus was witnessing with these two brothers. Here, these villages did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as he was called. And their response is, Jesus, we know you can do miracles, Bring down that fire and brimstone and destroy these villages. Loving, kindly disciples <laughs> of Jesus. So you can imagine Jesus witnessing this humbleness of these two, or lack of humbleness of these two, and giving them this name, son, sons, of, sons of Thunder, clear lack of humility. And as you can see, and as we go through this, you can see that how John's personality changes to the disciple whom Jesus loved. Repeated again and again from Son of Thunder. Another little example I found for John and James again, and you may recall the story is there going to Jesus and talking about the kingdom and it's uh, Jesus can we be on your right and left side when you rule in the kingdom can we be the higher ups can we be the vice kings in the new kingdom can you give her so so they go to Jesus and obviously, humbly asking them, asking Jesus, if they could be the, you know, the greatest apostles alongside Jesus himself when the kingdom is put together. Even though there's obviously 12 other, 10 other apostles that are probably listening and watching this happening. Uh, and what did Jesus do as they sought favor with Jesus, he rebuked them. So he rebuked them with their attitude towards this unauthorized person seeking out, seeking to, to remove demons from people. He rebukes them again when they're calling down fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy, village, to destroy people in the villages. He rebukes them when they are cornering Jesus and said, can we be the two big shots when the kingdom exists? So, sons of thunder, as John and his brothers start, and as you go through, you'll see, as we continue to study John, that you'll see the humbling of John, the humility of John, the lessons as he starts to reflect Jesus more and less of himself. So John's legacy, uh, I'll look at uh, 1 John 1 to 4. 1 John, 1 John 1 to 4. Reading from 1 John 1 to 4. That, and again, this is 
This is John speaking as an eyewitness. And that's a good point to remember. John is an eyewitness writing in his writings. Remember, Matthew was an eyewitness. Luke was not an eyewitness. Matthew was an eyewitness. And so is John. So, so 1 John 1 to 4, an, eye, an eyewitness. That which, was, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our, and our hands have handled of the word of God. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So here John is reminding the readers that he's an eyewitness to the Lord, and also refuting some of the doctrines that were starting at the time. One of them was that Jesus was a spirit and rose as a spirit. And that heresy John addresses clearly here, where he says, we held him. We touched him. You know, again, re refuting that whole apostasy of that Jesus came back as a spirit. And if you remember, he came to the upper room. He said to Thomas, touch me. He said, I'm hungry, feed me. That's not the characteristics of a spirit. But more importantly, John is here writing that we saw, we touched Jesus, and what we want is for you to have the same fellowship with him as we had with him. And John in Galatians is also called one of the pillars of the faith. Like Peter, John was one of the pillars of the early church as well. Uh, alongside Peter, he preached and performed miracles and he traveled often with Peter. He authored five books of the New Testament. The last gospel, which is the Gospel of John, was written about 80 to 90. Uh, Bible scholars feel that John, the book of John, was written after Revelation. Revelation, if you remember, was on the island of Patmos, and the early church fathers say that he was um, he wasn't acquitted but a new Caesar came in and many of the people were free because he was a prisoner on Patmos he went back to Ephesus and I'll explain why he went back to Ephesus and in Ephesus toward the end of his life he wrote the book of John so we're seeing about 10 years before, so he was in his 80s probably, he wrote the book of John. And again, his emphasis is that I, John, I am an eyewitness. You can believe me, I saw him, I felt him, I lived with him. The gospel also had, John adds a number of unique things that other books do not. And one of them that I noted that I never thought of is the seven I am's. And if you think of them, I don't know how many you recall, when I got to this point, I could recall four of the seven. But the seven I am's. I am the bread, the light, the door, Amen. the good shepherd, the resurrection, the way and truth, the vine. So that's unique to John. John also declares who has John 20, 30, 31? I do. Okay, loudly please. John 20, 30, 31. John declares his purpose clearly. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, 
which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And the key word for John, you may have heard it before, is believe. And in the book of John, he uses the word 100 times. Oh. Believe, believe. And John's book has more of a focus on spiritual truths, more so than, say, action. We think of the book of Mark as, you know, Jesus went here, then he went there, then he went, and John is more, more or less, more of a, uh, speaking about what is truth. Like Luke, also, the book of John has no geneal genealogy. And again, that's partly due to the fact that he's great writing so many years after Christ, people know about Jesus. The disciples have now, like Paul, going throughout the Mediterranean, so John doesn't have a genealogy because the books of Mark, the books of Matthew have the genealogies. They came out long before John wrote his book. So John 13, 21, 25 begins to show the change of John. In John 13, let me turn there. John 13, 21, 25. And this is about the authorship of the book of John. John does not mention his name once in the book of John, nor in his letters. But you can attribute to John, and these are some of the telltale um, items that you can use to say that John wrote it. So in John 13, 21 to 25, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified very, very, I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. This is again in the upper room at the Last Supper. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he, he, he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Remember that term, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him so it's obviously not Simon Peter. And the two closest <laughs> disciples to Jesus, to his ministry, was Simon Peter, John, and Andrew. So it wasn't Simon Peter. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him, that is to John, that he should ask who should be of whom he spake. In other words, who would betray Jesus? He, he which is John, then lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? So here they're at the Last Supper. Here John is laying on the chest of Jesus. And I heard one preacher say, can you imagine hearing the heartbeat of Christ laying on his chest? And another little aside note I got was, he's laying on Jesus' bosom. And we use the term bosom buddies. And that's where it comes from. Here's John laying against the bosom of Jesus. And Peter asks, John, can you ask Jesus who's going to betray him? It's, it's, it's amazing from this son of thunder to have this close relationship with the Lord now. Or one of the closest relationships with the Lord now. Uh, someone have uh, John 21, 20 and 24? John 21, 20 and 24? Yes? Well, I'll continue then. Want me to read it? Uh, if you have it, yes. What is it, 21 what? 21. 2024. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. John 21, 2024. 20, okay. Then Peter, turning about, 
See if the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Mm -hmm. This is the disciple which testified of all these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So what happened here, again, Peter <coughs> is talking with Jesus, and Jesus is telling Peter how he will be martyred. Mm -hmm. And behind them is John, mm -hmm. and Peter refer refers to him over as the, the man that was laying on Peter's chest at the dinner. Mm -hmm. And Peter's asking the Lord, well, how will this person which is John, be martyred. And Jesus basically says, that's not for you to know. But again, you can see the relationship. Peter and John are the closest, and Peter uses John, like here, to compare himself to John, and how is John going to die? And also at the Last Supper, since, since John is so close to Jesus, John, ask him, who's, who's the one that's going to... Um, Who's going to betray him. betray him or betray us in that sense? And the early fathers, again, the early fathers are basically between the year 100 and 200. The early fathers wrote also, even though it's John's name is not mentioned, that, the, that surely the disciple whom Jesus loved was John. And it's identified, John identifies with Jesus more in a relationship basis. So if you read something like Mark, you know, Mark is giving, documenting what's going on, where he's going, what miracles are happening. And here John is more of the relationship he is having with the Lord Jesus Christ. So John, from the, from the son of thunder, that Jesus gave him the name, is really now the trusted, loved, faithful apostle. John was trusted of setting up the Last Supper. Jesus tells he and Peter go into Jerusalem, set up the dinner, the Last Supper dinner. He was sent to Samaria when they heard that there were Samarian believers. Jesus sent John and Peter up to Samaria to actually sort of investigate and see if these believers have the Holy Spirit. John was with Jesus, the raising of Jairus' daughter. John was at the Transfiguration. Again, the closeness in that relationship, at the Transfiguration. John, uh, nine, John 19, 25 to 27. And this is one of the biggest pieces of information that I got from the Bible that I didn't really think about before. John 19, and I'll read 25 to 27. John 19, 25, and this is at the cross. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, remember that term, the disciple whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. So he's saying to Mary, Behold your son. And he's acknowledging John, not himself. Then saith he to the disciple, John, John, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her onto his own home. So one thing I would like to point out is 
So Jesus had four brothers. Jesus was the senior brother, and in that custom, he would have the responsibility of taking care of his mother, since it seems that Joseph was no longer alive. So why would Jesus ask John to take care of his mother and not having four brothers? And just looking further at the scripture, it's very clear. So John's four half-brothers, firstly, at this time, they're not saved. That's one important factor. Later, as you know, two of his brothers are saved, James and Jude, both right and are in the scriptures. But at this point, his brothers are not at the cross, and Mary's at, his mother's at the cross, and John is at the cross, no other disciples. So Jesus is effectively telling John to adopt his mother, well, you could say adopt him as a brother, because he's saying, John, this is now your mother. So, firstly, this, his brothers were not believers, but also, I believe, and as we go through the, the disciple that John loved, that Jesus loved, this was such a strong relationship, and John was there at the cross, that Jesus felt and trusted that the faithful John could take care of his mother. And again, later we know his two brothers, at least two of his brothers were saved. But it's an interesting question when you come to it, why John? And I never thought about that before. And John, again, to early church history, took care of his mother until John's death. When he returned from Patmos back to Ephesus, he took care of Mary then to his death. And I saw a tourist program once in Turkey. It was about travels in Turkey. And lo and behold, this was about a year ago, uh, the tour director's talking about, oh, and here we have the house of Mary in Ephesus. And I never put two and two together that, again, this is a tourist group, nothing to do with the biblical narrative, but clearly the early church said that John took Mary to Ephesus, where he passed away in Ephesus, and Mary continued living in Ephesus. So John was faithful to the end. He was at Jesus' side in Gethsemane. Remember when he, Jesus went forward, disciples stayed back, he asked Andrew, Peter, John to come with him. John followed after the arrest, as I mentioned. Mary Magdalene arrives at the tomb, sees it's empty, runs back to Mark's mother's house, and reports that the tomb is empty. Who's the first one that arrives there? John. Peter following. Some some scholars say that's also maybe a hint that John is the youngest because he was the fastest <laughs> on his feet. But immediately he runs to the tomb first. So what's the Sunday school lesson for time? Sunday school. From John's calling in Galilee, follow me, we immediately follow him. To his death in Ephesus, including take care of, taking care of Mary to the end. He lived a trustworthy life, a loving life. He was the apostle who Jesus loved, and a faithful, long life. Devoted to Jesus, no matter what the consequences. And speaking of the consequences that John knew, can you imagine following Jesus after the arrest? What could have happened to John also? Can we all turn to Luke 9, 23 to 25? Luke 9, 23 to 25. So Luke 9, 23, we're all there. And he said to them, 
This is Jesus speaking to them, his disciples. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away or lose his soul? So what does it profit a man who gains the whole world but loses his soul? And here John, a faithful, devoted, loving disciple to the end, is a great example for us. The consequences were there. He obviously was cast into a prison in Patmos, and where he wrote the book of Revelation. And also, he lived a long life, but had a difficult life. But the Lord blessed him with long life and a natural death, unlike the other disciples. So think of our legacy. What would our legacy be as a disciple of Christ? And Lord, we thank you for the scripture that gives us the character of a man who wrote many books in the Bible, many letters in the Bible, but who as an example was one of the son of thunder and Jesus called him to one of the disciples who Jesus loved. May we hold that in our hearts and may we too be a disciple of who Jesus loves. In this name, amen.